Hello and welcome to my next GCSE video on classification, variation and inheritance. Classification is the process of sorting organisms into groups based on their characteristics. Now, there is a seven part classification system. That means that all animals are firstly split into a kingdom, then into a phylum, then a class, then an order, then a family, then a genus, then a species. There will be one species, but there could be a number of species in a genus, a number of genuses or genii in a family, a number of families in an order and so forth. Now kingdom, there are five kingdoms. And these are Animalia, Plantae, Fungi, Protoctista and Prokaryote. Animalia, now there's some main characteristics of each kingdom. For Animalia, the organisms are multicellular, heterotrophic, which means that they do not produce their own food. Um, they're feeders, so they don't have chlorophyll because they can't make their own food. They have no cell walls and they are complex cell structures. They have a nucleus. Plantae, again, multicellular, autotrophic. They can produce their own food, so they have chloroplasts with chlorophyll in. The cell walls are made of cellulose and they have a nucleus. Fungi. Again, multicellular. Cell walls are not made of cellulose. They are made of chitin. They are saprophytic feeders with no chlorophyll. They are saprotrophic, which means that they can feed on like decaying matter and stuff. And they have a nucleus. Protoctista, usually uncellular. They can have unicellular, sorry, but they can be multicellular. They can have a nucleus. Though well, they will have a nucleus. But... Um, Protoctists are generally the outcasts of the other four. And prokaryote, they are unicellular, simple cellular structures with no nucleus. And they can be autotrophic or heterotrophic. A little point to mention is that viruses, which you should know about, are not in a kingdom. Because many scientists don't believe they are alive. They take over cells, but they don't show life themselves. Vertebrates belong to the phylum Chordata they have a backbone. This backbone will be made out of vertebrae, They're called vertebrates. Animals that do not have a backbone are invertebrates. Now, out of the vertebrates, there are a five main groups. You have mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. What we want to do is then group these organisms. What you do is look at oxygen absorption. So do they use lungs or gills? Reproduction, do they use internal fertilization? That is like mammals and birds and reptiles do. Or do they use external fertilization? So that is when eggs are released externally and fertilized outside the body. And temperature controls. So are they what we call homeotherms? Will they um, be able to control their own temperature? So reptiles and amphibians can't, but mammals and birds can. Species. A species are a group of organisms that can produce, reproduce to produce fertile offspring. So humans can interbreed with each other and produce fertile babies. That's the important bit, it's fertile. Now, some species can interbreed with other species. For example, zebras and donkeys, z donks, horses and donkeys mules. But these are infertile animals, which means they are not a species because they are not fertile. That's the important thing. However, there are a few hybrids, a little bit of extra information, that can be fertile. There is a something called a wolfin, which is the um, product of a, I believe it's a female bottlenose dolphin and a male um, false killer whale, or the other way around. So one male, one female. And these wolfins have been seen to be fertile. Three of them have been. So they could be described as a known species. One problem with classification is something called a ring of species. Now this is when hybrids that are fertile are formed and then breed with either the, one of the species, let's say mallard ducks, they can produce hybrid offspring, but then that hybrid offspring can either reproduce with each other or mallard ducks, and this ends up producing a continuous range of characteristics. And then if lots of different um, ha lots of different neighbouring species have different characteristics, 
There's a chain of different populations that could all breed with the neighbouring populations, but the two populations at the other end of the chain cannot interbreed. So think of it like a little spectrum. So you have, let's say, imagine they are letters. So you have A is one species, Z is another. Now all the species in between A and Z can in, in, you know, interbreed, so you have D can easily interbreed with C and E, but A and Z cannot. So that's kind of like a ring, so it kind of goes round. That makes sense. Naming species, we do something called binomial naming. We have a genus name and a species name. Now genus is capital, species is lowercase, and it's all in italics or underlined. Homo sapiens. Um, Panthera leo, I think. So that's how you... So for example, you have Homo, um, Homo habilis, that is another species of Homo, so it's in the same genus, Homo, but it has a different species name. Differences between characteristics is called variation. Interspecies variation is between different species. So the differences are characteristics between humans and monkeys. Intraspecies variation is within a species. So that's the difference between you and a friend of humans. Classification. Now, what's the why we use classification is because it allows for easy identification of species, shows how organisms are related. So you can tell, for example, that you know humans and um, apes share 97% DNA or more, I think it might be, which shows we're very closely related, and that means we'll be in the very similar, perhaps the same family or even the same genus if it was even closely, more closely related. And it also identifies areas high and low in biodiversity, because biodiversity is a measure of the total number of different species in an area. Now, to count the species, you need to be able to identify them, which can be tricky. So, if you have a classification system, you can tell how many species there are. Now, also something we use to classify is something called a dichotomous key. This is just a set of questions. So, you'll have maybe six species, five questions. That's always what you want to have. One more number of species than the questions. So, seven questions, eight species. And so, you just yes or no questions. So you would say, you know, um, does it have four legs? Yes, go to this question. No, go to that question. And so you can use it to identify. Now, there are two types of variation. You have genetic variation and environmental variation. Genetic variation is what you get in your genes. It's characteristics you show from your genetic material. Environmental variation is something that occurs when you've changed to the environment. Now there's also you have discontinuous and continuous variation. Discontinuous variation is always genetic. Continuous variation can be either. Here's an example. They, the graph line shows eye colour. It's discontinuous variation. Brown, blue, green, hazel. You can't have in-betweens. Uh, some could argue you can, but genetically no. You have one or the other. That's discontinuous. The curvy graph is human height, and that's continuous variation. Now, this can be caused by both genetic and environmental factors. So if you eat a lot, you will grow more. It's a fact. But if you have naturally tall parents, you will probably be taller than if you have naturally small parents. So it's kind of a bit of both genetic and environmental. So genetic variation caused by your genes, that's from your parents, environmental variation will be controlled by your habitat. So, for example, if you were to live, now this actually this this interest this is how color skin color came about. Skin color is now genetic, but it used it actually originated from environmental variation. If you live in the sunny parts of the world, particularly like Africa, you will have darker skin because it will not absorb as much heat. So you won't get as hot. If you're in colder parts of the world, lighter skin will help you absorb more. It's more important. So it helps you absorb more sunlight for heat and for vitamins. So it is. that's how that started. So it's now genetic because if you are black, you have black parents, you'll have black children. If you have white parents, you'll have white children. Um, but it was derived from environmental variation because... As people originated in Africa and moved north into Europe, they didn't need 
they needed more sunlight. They got there was less sunlight. They need more of it to be absorbed, so their skin got paler to absorb it. So that's how that's that's evolution for you, which is what we're on to next. Evolution. Now you have natural selection. This was proposed by Darwin. Now this is survival of the fittest. Essentially, an organism displays a random characteristic, a mutation, and it will show that characteristic. If that characteristic gives it an advantage, let's say it's a giraffe and it's mutated a longer neck than the other giraffes, it can get higher, you know, leaves higher on trees. So it's going to be able to eat more. That's an advantage. It'll survive, it'll pass on that gene while shorter neck giraffes will die. They are not as fit as longer neck giraffes. And so the babies are more likely to have longer necks and the ones with the longer necks out of the babies will survive until you get evolution occurring to giraffes with longer necks. So organisms that can adapt to their environment survive. And what this happens when you have loads of changes and loads of evolution occurring a lot and a lot, eventually you will have a set of organisms that are different from the original set. So they've evolved a lot and then they can no longer interbreed. So you have, let's say, you originally had species A but then half of the species adapted and became got a change and then they got more changes as they adapted more and became became a, unable to interbreed with species a but they could interbreed with each other so they're called now species b and that's how evolution works this is called speciation the creation of a new species genes right now you have a nucleus in the nucleus, there is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, all the easy note. And then each strand of DNA forms a structure called a chromosome. There are 46 chromosomes in humans, there are 23 pairs. Now, when you have a chromosome, there are it's in a little X shape. So you have two halves of a chromosome so you think of it there so you can see the diagram imagine that they're actually joined at the little center bit of each chromosome now one one half of the chromosome will be have a gene or will have many genes actually one half has let's say one at the top you can see the black gene there and on the other side of the chromosome it will have the same gene it'll code for the same thing but it might have a different allele this allele is just what is you know different forms of the same gene different alleles of the same gene so as you can see on the diagram look at the one with the black strip at the top you have black strip that's one gene the diagonal line is another gene the circles is a different gene those are all different genes now if you look on the white topped chromosome or half the chromosome the white one is a different allele. So alleles are different forms of the same gene, so you have different alleles. But at the bottom, the bottom two, the diagonal one and the circles are the same, so they are the same allele. Now that can be quite confusing to explain, but I hope that makes sense. Gametes. Now these are sex cells. Animals in male have sperm cells, and females have egg cells, plants have pollen grains, and then egg cells for female. Now, this diagram is very important. You have dominant and recessive genes. A dominant gene will always win. So if you have one dominant, one recessive, the dominant genes shows through. Now, this is very common when it comes to eye colour. Brown is a dominant gene. Blue is a recessive gene. So that means if you have blue eyes, both genes must be for blue eyes. If you have brown eyes, you could have both genes brown, or you could have one gene brown, one gene blue. This can be shown by a Punnett square. That's a little square in the corner. Capital B is for brown, small b is for blue. So if you look now, now say the top one's mother and the side one is the father. If the mum is brown, and the father has brown part they both so in this case both parents have one dominant one recessive gene of each so one brown one blue gene now if the parents pass on one the brown gene each pass on the brown gene the children will have double dominant 
and they will have brown eyes. If the mother passes on the blue and the father passes on the brown, they have one brown, one blue, so the eye colour will be brown, but the child could pass on blue eyes. So, and then if the same for the, if the mother passes on the brown and the father passes on the blue, that will still produce brown eyed children. If the mother and the father pass on blue, double recessive, blue wins. So you get blue eyes. That means there is a 75% chance of brown, 25% of blue. Now, this also means if you have brown eyes, if both parents have brown eyes, they could produce a child who has blue eyes, 25% chance. As you can see, both parents here are brown eyed, but they could produce a blue eyed child. Now, what we say is B, you know, capital B, small b, that's the genotype. That is the alleles in an organism. And what the organism looks like, what the actual feature is, that's the phenotype. So, for example, the genes of hair colour could be one thing, that's the genotype, and the actual colour of the hair, what you see, is the phenotype. Genetic disorders. Two you need to know about sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis. Now, sickle cell anemia is caused by a faulty allele. And the alleles are recessive. So people have two copies of the allele suffering disorder. So you can be a carrier if you have one dominant, one recessive, but you won't show it unless you have both recessives. And what it does, it causes red blood cells to go into sort of sickle shape. It means they can't carry as much oxygen, so they become tired, short of breath, and blood vessels get blocked as well because of the shape. And it can be very painful. Cystic fibrosis, again, on the recessive allele. So you could have... You could have an, a gene for cystic fibrosis, but not show any symptoms yourself. What happens here is the lungs get clogged with thick mucus. Mucus also blocks on the tubes that carry enzymes to the small intestine to digest food, and this can result in weight loss and difficulty in breathing as well. So, thank you for watching. As usual, any questions, leave in the comments, especially about the chromosomes and ladies. That can be a very confusing thing. But um, like, comment, subscribe, whatever. Thank you for watching and goodbye.